My greatest joy in life, honestly, now more than it ever was, uh, is seeing the joy of other people discovering God's best for their life. Uh, I'm completely fine with, with, with being your greatest cheerleader because I, I see God's able to do more through that. You know, we all have a part to play. But I also um, remember this and, and, and saw this. Growth takes patience and time. Growth takes patience and time. I want to give you a perspective on that. How many of you have ever heard of Seacoast Church? Okay. Uh, in fact, um, Seacoast and our church, we're all members of the same association uh, called ARC that um, is, is, is churches all over the United States that uh, primarily exist to reach the unchurched and lost. Most people see um, Seacoast with the thousands and thousands that they have now in the multiple campuses. Do you know Seacoast was 10 years old before they ever saw beyond 350 people? Okay. Do you know this? That um, only 10% of churches in America ever average over 200, ever. Only 1% of churches in the entire United States see 1,000 or more. So you have to understand, listen, if it was easy to just take a church to where you just easily brought in the villages, it would just be simple. We'd just pray a little prayer. We'd come together and we'd invite them. But how many of you know that's just not that easy, is it? As I mentioned earlier, when I moved here, I was not looking to pastor another church. In fact, my wife would have told you she wasn't looking for me to pastor another church anytime soon. She had already seen what a hot mess her husband was. But I want you to know, I remember, I remember going to her, and I knew it was not the time. How many of you know you, you, you're bringing something to your spouse, and yet you know it's not a good time? Uh, and, and that was in August of 2011, shortly after we moved here. I'm like, you're not going to want to hear this, but... God's like getting all over me, like, hey, I'm probably going to have to start a church here in Waterboro. She said, well, you better, you better deal with that. And she didn't mean any harm by that. We were healing. I processed and I prayed about this basically every day, starting in August of 2011. I asked God to restore my health. I asked God to restore my family. And then I asked God that if it was his will for me to start a new church, that he would give me a clear vision because I, I learned from the time before the vision has to be clear. You have to know where you're going. How can you invite other people to join you? I still remember pulling on the side of the road, and I wrote down what God gave me for the vision. God said, Refuge Church should exist to love, lift, and lead people to Jesus. That's not a fancy slogan I tried to come up with. You, you notice on this board over here, we want to love God, and we want to love people right where they are. No strings attached. We want to lift up Jesus in everything that we do and we say. And then we want to lead other people. We want to point each other, point one another and others to Jesus. Because, listen, you can't push anybody anywhere, okay? It's not our job to push. It's our job to pray. It's not our job to save them. It is our job to point them to the Savior. I knew before we ever started Refuge Church, before we had anybody. Because, uh, listen, vision is, uh, as, as a gentleman once said this to me, vision is you got to see it before you see it. you got to trust that God sees it before you see it. So when you follow God, by the way, in case you want it in your own life, you, you keep saying, God, what do you want for my life? You take that next right step, and then he brings results that you had no idea were on the other side. God had many of you in mind when he gave me the heart and the, 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 the pulling, and he did have to pull me, I'll be honest with you. I would, I, would be, I would be a hospice chaplain right this moment if all I got to do was choose what I do. I love being by people. I love coming alongside people. That's just my greatest joy. That's my greatest comfort zone, honestly, is to just be with people. But how many of you know sometimes God will pull you out your comfort zone? You know, just because you're not comfortable with something doesn't mean God's not calling you to something. But I knew that this church was meant to reach and target the 30,000 out of 39,000 in this county alone that do not go to church anywhere. I knew this church was meant to reach the lost and the unchurched that, that otherwise would not be reached. Because I want you to hear something from me. Going to the days where you put up a sign that says, all welcome and people come. Going to the days where you just build some fancy church and people just come. People don't think that way. They got Disney World and other stuff, okay? 
People are won by relationship. People are, are love to Jesus. Eight years ago in January 2014 at the Colleton Recreation Center, Refuge Church launched its first Sunday morning refuge uh, worship service. Since that day, we've seen many, many folks walk through the doors of the church from the wreck to here to the parking lot, wherever. We baptized over 100 souls over the last eight years. Many people consider Refuge Church their church home, whether they're with us weekly or whether they just listen to us online or, 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 or whether they just come see us occasionally when they, when they feel like it. We have a clear vision. God gave us a clear vision of how we could make a great, great difference. You know, this is coming from a pastor whose health has failed him over and over again. But you know, sometimes God decreases you so that he can get you out of the way, as well as so that you will look at some other options. Because if you're like myself and you have a do it, I'll just do it myself mentality, hey, it's just easier to do it myself, it becomes difficult for you to delegate. But I want you to understand, I like the word delegate now. One, it's the only way I can stay healthy and continue to pastor this church. But two, it's the only way this church will grow. We have to continue to, to grow in those getting involved. So I know this, that the future of this church rests on this. We have to move from a me to a we mentality. Some of you have heard me say this before. God made it very clear, Craig, this go around in this church, don't build church on Craig, build church on Christ. If you feel led to be a part of this church, if you believe this ministry is vital to you, your family, and, and this community, I want to invite you to keep taking steps forward with us to finding your place in this ministry because you are part of the we. The we is not the people around you, even though they are we's as well, but, but it, is, it is you. I want to share with you today seven things that we must do each to keep moving forward. And how this church is going to move from a me to a, a uh, we mentality. The first thing is this. We all need to join by grace through faith. We all need to join by grace through faith. Listen, the only way that we are saved from our sin and what our sin then brings upon us and, and what we deserve is by the grace of God. By God's grace and through our faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are we saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done so that none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. If there's one thing I know that the culture out here can't stand is people who think they are self-righteous. No, we are covered in his righteousness. The only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is we're saved sinners. They're lost sinners. When people can see the grace of God in our life, they can sense the hope of the grace of God in their life. Christ has created us anew so that we can do the good things that he's planned for us in advance. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41 says, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. The moment that you were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and by grace through faith in Christ became a, a believer, you became a child of God, you became an instant member of the church. There's two kinds of churches, by the way. There's the universal church, which represents all Christians throughout the world. And then there's a local church, which represents churches like here. By the way, any church 
absolutely any church in our county or beyond that is, is in Christ, we're all on the same side, and it's time that we start acting like it. We're all on the same side. Christians, we're too, it's bad when we fight with each other more than we fight the demons of this world. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But all who believed him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Again, there's nothing you did to deserve salvation. There's nothing you did to deserve to be called a child of the king. But by grace through faith you are. Listen, as believers, we're all frogs. Write that down. I hate to call you a frog today, but I'm one too. And here's what the frogs stand for. Fully reliant on God's grace. Fully reliant on grace for salvation. When we forget God's grace, we fail to demonstrate grace. See, I like the fact that God oftentimes put me in my place. He oftentimes does that so that I get a little more humble, a little more dependent upon him. But secondly, we all need to love the church like Jesus. We all need to love the church like Jesus. We just sang about it, but I want you to remember this. Jesus gave his life for the church. Who's the church? The body of Christ. Every person who is in Christ. The only reason you have hope, the only reason we have a reason to worship, the only thing that we have all in common is Christ. Listen, Jesus gave his life for the church and so that we could have this hope. So listen, church was not man's idea. Just because man turned Christianity into a religion instead of a relationship doesn't mean the church is not have a place. Ephesians 5.25 says Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. I'll tell you right now, after my first church that I started, I didn't like church too much. In fact, if I'm honest, my, my wife um, kept um, uh, giving me spiritual CPR for the first three years of this church. I wanted to quit a lot of times, which wasn't a good ingredient because when you're a pastor, you already want to quit every other Monday. But I wanted to quit for another reason. I, di I didn't have, I, you can lose your confidence in something, okay? See, some of you, you had bad church experiences. Didn't matter if it was just even one. So that made you not want to walk into a church, am I right? Or just walk into any church. Well, you can be a pastor and you're like, man, I can, I can do more without all that red tape out here in the world than having to deal with, with, with this and that. Listen, that, that when the church is the way the church should be, the church is a beautiful thing. But sometimes we get a bad experience, and it makes us lose our confidence. But I want you to understand this. God's not lost his confidence in the church. It is still, I want you to write this down. The church is still God's main vehicle to give, share the gospel with the world. The church is still the number one entity that God plans to use to reach people, whether we get to meet inside or not. Listen to what the Word tells us pastors, Acts 20, 28, out of the Amplified Bible. It says, take care and be on guard for yourselves and for the whole flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd, tend, feed, and guide. The church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I can't outgive God. I can't outserve God because Jesus gave it all. He paid it all. By the way, Scripture says that anyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. So if you're planning on surrendering your life to Christ and not think that it doesn't have to lead to some sacrifice... You'll never follow Christ. Every one of us, we sacrificed to be here today. We could have been somewhere else. But you, but you said, hey, this matters. But thirdly, we all need to love one another well. We all need to love one another well. Listen, the church, which is made up of blood-bought believers in Christ, we should be the most loving people on the planet. We should outdo the Salvation Army. We should outdo Goodwill. We should outdo any group that exists. But you know what? A lot of times, we just stink at it. That's why people think to themselves, they say, well, when I get into that church, I'll find out whether they really, really, really going to love somebody like me. Please prove them wrong. 
Do you know I baited people at the door? I did this the first couple of years of the church. I literally would, would find different people who I said, listen, I want you to come and I want you to visit Refuge Church. And when you walk through those doors, if you let me know that you weren't glad that you were here and you didn't feel welcome when you walked in, please come back the next week because whoever greeted you won't be there. Why I say that? Because I think most of you share this in common with me. You understand if we don't have love, we don't have a bridge. No one wants to hear another sermon. Listen, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I want you to look to your right and to your, um, uh, to your left and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm your sibling. In fact, I just realized this. This even goes for your spouses. This is really going to seem weird. <laughs> hey, I'm your brother. I'm your sister. Don't say that out of context on social media, okay? You from Colorado County, they'll be all over that. Okay, I will be too. I'll be like, what else did they say after that? But we're brothers and sisters. Listen, it's time that we treat each other like that. Brothers and sisters, what do you do? When it's all said and done, you're like, listen, this is my blood. John 13, 34 through 35 says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Listen, love them out there, love them in here, and let God reach them. 1 John 4, 16 says, We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. When you can't love other people as Christ loved you, it just means you're full of the devil. Doesn't even necessarily mean that you aren't a Christian. But you're blocking out the love of God, therefore you're walking in disobedience. Because listen, you can't love God with all your heart without loving other people. I didn't say you had to like them. I got a long I don't like list. We all got do not like list. Don't act like you don't. Okay? Just because you didn't say it on Facebook. Listen, the early church, what jumps out, we'll read about here in just a few, about them is they cared so deeply about each other. They gave up things, even land, anything they could of their possessions to help other people who were knocked down in life. Listen, the church should be the most loving bunch on the planet. Why? Because we've experienced God's love, and so now God's love is meant to flow through us as it has flown and flowed to us. But fourthly, we all need to come together often. We all need to come together often. There's plenty of people out there go, well, it's 2022. Everything's online nowadays, Pastor. You don't understand. We, you know, what you old folks do now, that ain't what us young folks can do. All I can do is hope to change that trend. I want you to hear that. By the way, we were all young once too. It might have wanted to run a million miles away from the church and look at us now. You know, I told y'all before, every time somebody said, are you going to go into ministry like your dad? I said, yeah, clown ministry. <laughs> I meant every word. And then God gets a hold of me at 18 years of age. And he's like, listen, I want you to surrender your entire vocation over to me. I'm like, what in the world? I want you to hear this, that there is something amazing that ha happens anytime two or more are gathered in his name. Matthew 18, 20 says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. Listen, this world, this life can quickly bring us down. It can pull us from God's best. It can divide us. In fact, we've seen that happening all throughout covid for many reasons, we all need to come together because there's already a million ways that the devil plans to pull us apart. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You know, many people complain about having to go to church weekly. Nobody said you have to go to church. I'm telling you, you get to go to church. Getting even, even getting to get to go to church reminds you of the hope that is in you and for you. Because sometimes we forget these things. I want you to make a commitment in your heart that forget about whether you're going to come here or not, no matter what. You know, something my parents taught me had ingrained in me wherever, wherever I moved, and I'm, we've moved a lot prior to um, coming to Collin County. 
We've been, we've been several places in Georgia, Texas, and, and here in South Carolina. But every place my wife and I moved, it didn't matter how young we were at anything, it, even before I, I was on staff, I would plug in and get involved at a church. You got to, listen, wherever God's got you planted right now, you commit to wherever God wants you right now. You don't take a break from the church. Listen, sometimes the times that we most want to break is the time that we most need the church. I want you to remember that. It's the very times that, that Satan's trying to make you run away from everybody that could help you get on the right track that you need to run to everybody who could take you to the next right track. But fifthly, we all need to play our part. We all need to play our part. This is where you're going to see a little bit different preacher coming out, okay? Not that I'm coming uh, to, to, to mean Craig or, or expectation Craig, but, but let me say this. To the people who, like myself, you know enough to be dangerous, you could preach the sermon. You don't really need to know any more scripture to understand at least that God's got a plan for you. God's got a place for you and, and how to live out obedient to him. God doesn't want you to just come to church. See, people won't stick around long at a church if they don't find their place. Now, I understand plenty of people stay at a church a long, long time just because of relationships, because for them it's just a, a, a time, a, a social time. But most people, they got to find a place. They got to find a reason. And listen, as God grows you, he shows you more things that he has for you. You don't have to have a titled position to determine in your heart that you're going to be a servant of Christ. And that you, you know, you know the best things I ever hear from anybody is this. Pastor, I'm just willing to help any way I can and however God leads. That's the, be that's the best thing. I, I, I hope you know. That's my goal. I, I, I will do whatever. If I need to clean the, the, the commodes starting this week, the advisory board tells me that, I'll, I'll start. I'll start on uh, Monday. But that, if I take the commodes, I want you to take whatever it is God's leading you to do. Listen, every believer has a place to serve in the body of Christ. Every one of you in here, you're a 10 out of 10 in something. You have abilities, you have gifts, you have certain passions, and we've got to figure out how to connect those passions. Maybe it might even be your career. Connect what you, who you already are so that it can be used for the glory of God and be connected to the church instead of two separate lives. 1 Corinthians 12 says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. We have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest, I want some of you to hear this. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Listen, each of you, you have value, you have purpose, and God has a part for you to play in the body of Christ, and we want to help you find that place. It may be a group that God's put on your heart that, that you need to aim towards trying to figure out how you can start. It may be a ministry we've not even thought about. Listen, when all the parts are working together, this church will have an amazing impact. You know why this church is not happening? I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now. The only, the only thing holding this church back from the impact that it will have is you and me. That's it. And I want you to know I'm embracing as a leader that it is our role to help you find your place and encourage you in that place. But number six, we all need to live out the gospel. We all need to live out the gospel. The mission field of the church is not on the inside of the building, but on the outside of these walls. 
Every believer has been called out to live out and to take the gospel to a lost world. That is our number one goal out there, outside of just living for the glory of God. Listen, we all need to share our faith, but it's really hard. I'm just going to hit some of you hard. It's really hard to share out something you aren't living out, isn't it? It's very hard. We all have friends, family, even total strangers that their salvation, I want you to take this to heart, there are people in your life that their salvation depends upon your obedience. You may be the only Jesus they see. And whether you like that or not, it still is the absolute truth for certain people. Do you know people are most influenced by people they trust? By people who they, they, they know? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, God wants everyone to be saved and to know the whole truth. Listen, the day that we, um, that we get used to men, women, boys, and girls dying and going to hell is the, is the, is the time that this church is just going to decline. See, as long, if, you don't, if you don't think like I'm thinking, whereas I'm going, hey, there's one more person to reach today, there's one more person to reach tomorrow, then what do you have to keep driving for? All you are is pulling people from other churches. That's not what we're trying to do here. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The invitation has been given. All we're doing as messengers, as ambassadors of Christ, is extending that uh, invite to others around us. And listen, oftentimes the greatest way to do that is through your testimony. And let your life back up the difference that Christ is making in you. Jesus Before he ascended into heaven, he gave us all as Christians this great commission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Some of you say, well, hey, you know what? I'm just not somebody that witnesses. God knows how you're wired. He's not asking you to be somebody you're not. But let God create a boldness within you. Care more about people finding Christ than what people think about you. John 1.12, Jesus says, And when I am lifted high from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. You know what I had to learn um, after many, many years in the ministry? Was that, that, again, I don't have to point people to me. In fact, it's, it's, it's my job to get out of God's way and to make sure you see that cross. We love this cross. We, we, love, we love the fact we want the cross to be bigger than us. We don't want you to miss Jesus when you walk in. Um, and, and, and somehow, Jesus has a way of grabbing your attention. Some of you right now, you're going, uh, I don't even know why, but, but, but God's just speaking directly to me. That's called the Holy Spirit, and that's called the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is alive and powerful. And we all know what it's like to, to have conviction from God. Then you've got to respond to that. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 through 12 says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's not Christians trying to say, hey, we're just narrow-minded about this Jesus. It's God's word that says only through Jesus. Romans 10, 14 through 15 Here's here's where the Apostle Paul gets very personal about, hey, are you going to do what you can to reach your friends, your family, your strangers, your neighbors? It says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Listen to me. Somebody brought the good news to you. You might not be able to even single that down to a single person. Do you know they say it takes at least, on average, seven seeds planted into someone's life before that person comes to Christ? Seven different people planting into that person's life. Are you playing your part? I want you to write this down. Who's in your top five? Who's in your top five? It is time for us to not just think about us, but think about those who don't know what we know and don't have the hope that we know. 
Why would they not go crazy when all their hope is in the White House or, in, or, or, or just whatever's going on in their world? When all that falls apart, what do they have? Nothing. Who should be in your top five that are potentially lost are definitely not involved in a church that need to be on your prayer list and are in the realm of your influence. Listen, you can't wholeheartedly love Jesus and not love others like Jesus. And you can't wholeheartedly love people and not tell them about Jesus. If Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to someone, why would you talk with your friends about everything else and everyone else, but you never, ever, ever have brought up your faith? Again, you don't have to preach at them. Let them see the grace of God preaching through you. Be like, man, let me tell you a little bit about how I used to live. That's when you get the good stuff, by the way. If you, can't, if you can't come up with some good stories that nobody's ever heard about you, you're already on the wrong track. He'll, by the way, hillbillies like to run into hillbillies. I try to, I try, I, I try to, I try to cover up my hillbilly with y'all sometimes, but I, at the same time, I got, it just keeps pouring out. I'm like, I, I mean, I'm like, okay, I bet I said something this Sunday. They're going to be like, I can't go back and listen to that nut preach again. But I got to just be me. You know what I'm saying? I just got to be me. You got to be you with Christ leading the way. But last but not least, we all need to be fully committed. We all need to be fully committed. The church is meant to be a group of called out believers. That's what the church is, by the way, ecclesia. It, it, it's, it means called out ones. We are called out to keep growing in Christ and to keep um, carrying out Christ to other people. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Listen to the commitment here of these believers. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the teaching, fellowship, to sharing in meals, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. They shared with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And listen to what their commitment led to. Each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Listen, do you know why I'm pastor at Refuge Church? Only one reason, because I feel called to be here. And because I am committed to God's church. My commitment is not dependent upon what you do or don't do. I mean this sincerely. If we were down to 10 people right now, I would just ask those 10, Hey, are you still on board with the mission? You, you have to be sure of whose you are, who you are, and where you are. Listen, my commitment is to Christ. I believe in the mission of the church. God has opened my eyes to that. You know what separates an above-average church from an average church? I can tell you right now one thing, commitment. Not to their plans, but to his plans. At an average church, this has been the case. I've been at a lot of churches in my time. I've served at seven different churches, and my dad's pastor five different churches while I grew up. At almost any church, 25% of the people do 100% of the work. We're going to radically shape, reshape this county because we're going to change those numbers and make it where only 25% at best don't know their place, don't know their purpose, and don't get in to all the way in to what God would have them to do. Listen, you've got to be all in or you're just all out watching it. And I want you to understand, this church cannot be above average without you. And that doesn't go to any age, by the way. These kids are just as important. They are the future. Any of you youth, any of you college students, and so on. Even, even those of you who go, well, you know what, Pastor, you, got, you caught me at a wrong time. I'm about 75 years older than Jesus. God, listen, if God hadn't taken you home yet, okay, you're not home yet. God's got a purpose. He's got a plan. They oftentimes say this about church, that older people bring stability. Young people bring energy and creativity. We hope to see all those things. Listen, when the church is all about Jesus and is all on board, seeking to live the mission, pray for the mission, support the mission, the church 
will be unstoppable. You're going to remember I said that, and I'm telling you, two years from now, if we stick to this path and we go where God's leading us now, and we radically all give what we can in our hearts, in our lives, God is going to do what you never dreamed possible he could do in your life and through the impact of this church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. That's the kind of church we're trying to be. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, right now, Lord, that despite me, Lord, that each person would will have heard what you wanted them to hear from your word. Lord, all I am is the messenger. And Lord, I too respond to that message, Lord, in telling you, here I am, send me. God, I'm praying for people who have, who have maybe a long, long time, Lord, they've been sitting on the fence, but Lord, they feel, they feel, Lord, you want more out of their lives. And you have more for their lives. God, I pray that whatever commitments they need to make, whatever things they need to resolve, whatever um, priorities they need to have, God, that you would, you would help them, Lord. Lord, you tell us to seek first your kingdom, and then all other things, Lord, will, will fall into place. We'll find this order. God, today, I, I thank you for the eight years that you've sustained this church. Lord, I know it's only by the grace of God that I'm still here. I know it's only by the grace of God that our doors are still open. But, Lord, we are still open. We are still ready. We are still willing. And, God, you've got a plan that is going to rock this county and beyond. And, Lord, it's going to lead hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, Lord, to Christ. God, I pray for that person today that you are, you are just grabbing their heart, saying, listen, come follow me. Trust me as your Savior and make me the Lord of your life. God, I pray today, Lord, that all who hear your voice calling out to them, Lord, they would surrender their hearts, their lives, their present, their past, their future to you. In Jesus' name we do pray.